party quarter. <laughs> All right. It's my uh, extreme pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues uh, at Multnomah County and the Multnomah Idea Lab, Erin McCarley and Steve Van Eck. They're going to present data analysis and um, some thinking that explores two questions. One, how is the way we think about poverty and those living in poverty profoundly impacts and influences the assistance we do or don't offer to them? And two, if we change our vision of what is poverty and who is living in poverty and why poverty happens, what can we do to more effectively intervene and, and, end the, um, and end that poverty, particularly related to cash transfers. And what I want to say is that we did this purposefully. So you heard from David a strategy for poverty reduction that focused on work. We're going to focus on poverty reduction that focuses on cash transfer and the transfer of money. So I hope you'll uh, listen uh, and, and compare these two things in your mind because that's where we want to have this discussion. There's, again, no right or wrong answer, but we're trying to pose uh, different ideas and different approaches. So with that, I will turn it over to Steve and Aaron. Hi, my name is Erin McCarley, uh, as Mary said, and I work in the Multnomah Idea Lab, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with you all this afternoon, and really to hear from you, because with the way that um, Steve and I are structuring that hour that we have with you is we want to raise some interesting questions to which we have ideas, but maybe not necessarily answers or solutions, and then give you all plenty of time to, uh, an opportunity to have some, some real conversation. Um, so that's the way we'll work through the next um, hour or so. Cool, I did that right. Um, so we're going to center our, center our conversation uh, today uh, around the problem of economic insecurity. Specifically, um, we know that uh, half of Americans will experience poverty during their lives, um, and half of those who leave poverty will become poor again within five years. Uh, we know US, U.S. Census and uh, uh, income data uh, tell us so. And more specifically, and I hope you've seen a lot of graphs today, which has been really exciting for me um, as a data person. Where, where are my data people at? Anybody else? Yeah, right? OK. So for some of us, this is great. For some of you, this may be traumatic. You may have to you know, overcome some, some stat course trauma. Uh, but for us, this is cool. So um, to break down this idea uh, that uh, many folks, half of Americans will experience poverty at some point in their lives, and many of those who escape poverty, who leave poverty, I should say, will, will turn back into poverty, wanted to display this, this graph, which I think makes this a little bit more um, concrete. Um, so on the right-hand axis, we have um, uh, household income in quintiles. Quintiles are fifths, or 20 percent of, of the whole. Um, on the far left, we've got uh, the first quintile uh, ends at about $20,000 a year. Um, the top quintile is $100,000 a year and up. Um, and of course, that right tail that trails out could trail out much, much further, right? We've got Bill Gates, we've got Jay-Z out there on the far right, right? Um, in territory that most of us will never visit, okay, but that's that, uh, that's that axis. Um, and on the uh, y-axis, we've got number of households, right? So the more blue, the, the greater number of households. And so to break that down further, we've got um, this as a uh, graph displays, that median income is at about $61,000 a year. And again, stat class, we remember median is the point at which that splits the distribution in half. So half of Americans make less than 61,000, half make more. But we know when we think about poverty that poverty isn't defined by being in the, the bottom, the, the lower median, right? We know that poverty, at least in terms of many of the benefits that we provide, um, is defined by the federal poverty limit. That's that red line that cuts down uh, the center of the of the hump there at the end, that magic 24-5 that B.J. Walker was talking about this morning, about $24,000 a year for a family of four. And so what we see is that many families may get above that, um, that red line, but due to circumstance um, and a whole lot of factors that we want to talk, touch on briefly, uh, many families will head back into poverty. And so that's that, that churn, for lack of a better word, um, that we see. 
So when we think about um, economic uh, insecurity, um, we really want to define that in terms of uh, both risks and hazards as well as uh, uh, capacity, right? Pr uh, ability to recover. And so um, economic security reflects exposure to several kinds of risks um, and uncertainty um, and a limited ability to cope with adverse outcomes and recover from those, from those events. So we might think of r those risks um, in a few different ways. So one kind of risk is those uh, idiosyncratic kind of risks that we uh, we may face, so illness, accident, uh, job loss, right? Um, and then there's uncertainty, as someone spoke earlier, um, about when you're in the midst of traumatic events and struggling to find housing for your family, that ability to plan can be impacted because there's so much going on. That question of what are you going to do with this $200 we're going to give you is a, is a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, and occasionally, as we all know, and I think you all deal with this regularly, um, these uh, events can, throw, can cause this kind of chain reaction um, where um, a, a person can be kind of circumstantially pushed back into poverty or into, po uh, into worse poverty. Um, car breaks down, can't get to work, lose your house. You see the, that kind of uh, a chain reaction of events uh, fairly, fairly frequently. Um, and while... When we think about accidents, illness, job loss, um, for some of us, we have insurance and uh, benefits that support us in those situations, right? I hit a deer in November. Um, I'm fine. The deer did not do well. Um, I have car insurance, right? Um, and I have coverage so I could get my car repaired. I have those kind of supports, right? Uh, but many folks may, may not, and then that becomes a financial burden that that family has to face. Similarly, we, well, many of us have unemployment insurance if we're in the kind of jobs that have unemployment insurance. My husband, who's a carpenter, does not, right? So unemployment for him means something very different. Um, so when we think about these shocks, some of us have the capacity to cope with them, supports that help us to cope with them that others uh, may not. Um, so ultimately, to, be, uh, to kind of summarize then, we would define security, that basic income security means having the ability to limit our exposure to those risks, um, and then when required, the ability to cope with those risks and to bounce back um, from the outcomes um, of those risks or of those um, challenges. Yeah? Take it over. We should have a ball. We're talking about having a ball to throw. But. All right. Oh, like that. Great. Hi, I'm Steve. Vanek, and I work in the Multnomah Idea Lab with Mary and Aaron and a few others. And uh, so having just heard about this definition or a concept around what economic insecurity is, I just want to lay a little bit of the roadmap for where we're going with that. So um, we're going to talk about some of the basic policies and plans and projects that we have had and all of us in, our, in this field are engaged with. And uh, I want you to think about those different projects and plans and policies and programs that you are a part of or familiar with uh, as you listen to this talk and as you engage in discussion. Uh, we're also going to talk about some different kinds of problems that come up in those different designs and then some principles that we might use to evaluate if we think that those ideas are good ideas, um, if we think that they meet our values or meet certain principles. And then we'll raise up some new ideas. So. So um, in a few different kinds, like sort of a framework, a few different kinds of ideas around what these designs might include would be uh, programs to address economic insecurity that are conditional. That means that they ask for some kind of behavior on the part of the participant or the part of the recipient. They might be conditional, um, on not just on the behavior, but also on what that benefit is spent on and how it's used. So a real basic concept there around what is a conditional program. Uh, there's also programs that might be designed for a certain kind of person or a person who's a certain group. You know, these would be targeted programs. Programs targeted to a person whose income is below a certain threshold. In that case, a design would include a means test to make sure they're in the group. Um, other kinds of programs might say that this is a program only for a person that has these kinds of characteristics. Um, we might think of 
WIC, for example, this is a program targeted to people who are mothers. If you're not a mother, sorry, you're not getting WIC. Um, so that's a different way of kind of thinking about that. There's also policies um, and programs that might be universal. So those are for everybody. And in that case, we would think of those who are included as those um, who have a right to that program or to those benefits. So we use those kind of tools as we think through these different designs of programs to address economic insecurity. So right now, I just want to uh, take a few minutes at your table and think through some of the policies that you're familiar with, some programs that you may work with, and let's use these terms to describe them. Um, I want you to think about, you know, take it, come up with a couple different examples, uh, not just one, a few different ones, and, and try to bounce these around and use these thinking tools for a moment. So um, is a program, is it conditional? Does it require a certain behavior? Uh, is it targeted for a certain group? Um, or is it for everybody? So let's just take a few minutes now and, and um, come up with examples. All right, we're going to bring it back together. Y'all will get a, a more opportunity to talk about the examples that you've come up with. But we want to um, add another layer, another kind of question for you to think about. In my um, skulking around and eavesdropping, um, one thing that I heard was it's hard to think of programs that are universal, that are a right for everyone. Yeah? And we're going to uh, have the opportunity, I think, to think a little bit more, talk a little bit more about why that is and what, what the impact of, of all those requirements are. So when we um, uh, design, program, design and implement programs, we can make at least, we can make plenty of errors. We do that all the time. We do. Y'all don't. Some of us do. Um, but we make all sorts of errors, right? And so these are at least three kinds of errors that we can make in designing and implementing programs. And the first is a, uh, an exclusion error. And this exclusion error rate could be high, could be low. This could happen a lot or very little. Um, but what that means is we're, plans may be structured um, such that we exclude a number of people who should get the benefit, right? For whom the benefit is intended. Um, and sometimes that exclusion rate is related to the number of barriers that we put in place for folks to, to demonstrate eligibility, for example. The more barriers, the, the higher the bar to become eligible, the more folks who may qualify, should qualify, but don't qualify because they simply can't, uh, uh, can't surpass that bar, can't meet those eligibility requirements. And those barriers may be about um, access to transportation. Often we make them come to us. It could be about language barriers. Um, so the more um, conditional and targeted programs can be, often the more barriers there are to folks getting qualified. Conversely, um, or related maybe is a better way to say, um, is inclusion error. Sometimes we may, uh, folks may be included in benefits for, for which they are not, that program's not intended. So folks may get benefits um, that they shouldn't get. Um, and I think sometimes we think of this as, as um, our funders don't think of this as uh, a, a good kind of error, but we may kind of feel a little bit more comfortable with this kind of error. Um, uh, recently, we were having some conversations with uh, Meals on Wheels uh, drivers and, uh, and seniors that they were serving. And Meals on Wheels, as you all know, designed for homebound seniors. But they admitted to us that there were, they saw some seniors who weren't necessarily homebound, but who didn't want to come in to the center for lunch or for food. Um, but they kept them on the rolls because they wanted to just keep an eye on them, right? So that, 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 that food delivery was a way to do kind of a welfare check, right? And so folks were getting services for which they weren't, technically those services weren't intended. That's the kind of inclusion error that maybe we're, I'm a little bit more comfortable with. I won't speak for y'all. And then lastly, uh, inefficiency error. Um, often uh, the more conditions um, that we put on uh, benefits that we're administering, um, the more criteria that we set up, maybe the more um, administrative costs are rolled into that, right, or, or, or the result of that. So and the higher the administrative costs, the fewer the dollars are left to go out to, to folks who need them, right, as actual, as actual benefits. So I wanna, we want to ask you to, again, returning to your table and to the examples of the programs that you administer, the ones that you're familiar with, right, um, 
stop and think about those programs with respect to these three questions. Um, who's excluded and shouldn't be? Three questions, four questions. Um, who's included, who maybe shouldn't be? And how, how okay are we with that? Um, would these programs be more efficient if they were universal? And would they be more efficient if they were unconditional, if they had fewer conditions placed on, on, on recipients' behavior? Yeah? All right, let's circle back to it. We'll give you about 10 minutes. All right, everybody, I'm going to bring you all back. Wrap those up. We'll have time in a few minutes to talk more. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Coming back. All right. So. I'm going to um, talk through a few different principles, and then we're going to get back to discussion again. You're having fun. Um, so I, just in popping around a little bit, what I heard was uh, folks talking about seeing a lot of exclusion error in the programs that they administer or the policies that they're uh, close to. It sounds to me like um, there's a, a lot of means testing going on. People aren't able to... Um, always prove that they are part of the group or prove that they are performing the behavior that the benefit that they need is conditional on. Um, and so they might be excluded from that. Um, so we can take a, a look at that. Um, and as we, we design programs, as we evaluate these programs, um, we also bring our own values to the table. Um, and I... We do this all the time, and, and I think it's really useful to just really as articulately as we can, as clearly as we can, say what those are so that they can become tests for us to see if the kind of programs that we design um, are able to, to um, reflect our principles and our values. So I would challenge you all to... Take a look at your own values and principles that you use to assess whether you think um, an idea is a good one or not. Um, but I'm going to just run through four different principles that uh, we've been looking at. And among those, the first is this idea of the security difference principle. And this was developed by John Rawls in the 70s. And uh, essentially, this idea is that a policy or program is just only um, if it improves the security of the least secure person in society or the least secure group in society. I hope that is a low bar. Uh, um, <laughs> but not always, unfortunately. Um, the second principle is the paternalism test principle. And this one can be a little harder. Uh, this principle... Uh, would say that a policy or a program is just only if it doesn't impose controls uh, that are not imposed on the most free groups in society. And in a minute, um, we're going to go back at these examples that we've been talking about, and we're going to run these principles as tests. So start to think about that. Um, the next principle is the rights, not charity principle. And in this principle, um, and I think this was developed by John Stuart Mills, um, and this principle would say that the person who's the recipient of the benefit has a right to that benefit, and that it's not really up to the bureaucrat or the philanthropist. Uh, it's not willy-nilly up to them at their discretion, um, but rather a policy or program would be socially just if it enhances the rights um, of the recipient and that it limits the discretionary power of the bureaucrat or of the uh, philanthropist in that regard. Finally, the dignified work principle. Um, this is a two-part principle. Um, and it's a little more uh, tricky, really. Um, this principle says that um, a policy or program is just if it doesn't impede people from pursuing work in a dignified way. Uh, and I think that we, at this point, would have to kind of ask ourselves, especially after the last talk, how we think about dignified work. 
Is dignified work uh, work that's safe? Uh, is it work that, uh, that helps you become self-sufficient? Is dignified work always work that pays? Um, is housework included in dignified work? I think there's a lot of questions for us, um, and I think that it's useful for us to nail those down for ourselves and answer those questions as we use these uh, four different principles as a test to evaluate our own programs and policies. So take the next couple of minutes uh, at your table. We're going to go back into discussion and uh, take a look at these questions. Um, does the program uh, meet each one of them? And go ahead and run through the, the list, and we'll come back in a few minutes. All right, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon. All right, let's come on back. We're going to keep working here. We've got a, a little bit further to go. All right. <laughs> All right, hello, everybody. I'm coming back. All right. So um, we just used these t thinking tools um, to take a look at some of our own programs and our own policies. Um, and now I want to use these same thinking tools to think about some new ideas. Um, but you know, chief among them uh, is the unconditional cash transfer question. So what would an unconditional cash transfer be? Well, we were just thinking about conditionality would be a program that's tied to behavior and it's tied to a specific kind of benefit. In order for a program to be conditional, you not only have to behave in a certain way, but you have to spend it on something specific. Uh, I think a, a great example of this is college scholarships, actually. So we might say, um, we would like uh, you, you know, a recipient, a possible recipient of a college scholarship to get all A's. Uh, so to incentivize you, to nudge you, uh, to do that, we're going to uh, provide you with this transfer. And not only do you have to get A's, but you have got to spend it on college. So that's an ex a sort of a classic, everyday example of a, of a conditional transfer. Um, and we as all have a lot of conditional kind of transfer programs. As I was walking around and sitting down with a lot of you, I heard a lot about testing and making sure that people behaved in the way that they're supposed to behave in order to get the kind of benefit that they needed uh, in order to get themselves out of economic insecurity. Well, um, we would like to uh, say a lot, if we could, about unconditional cash transfers. But it hasn't been tried much. Uh, I'm a researcher. I, I try to... Um, to know the best I can, you know, before going out and making a claim. I try to really be sh sure about it. But in the case of unconditional cash transfers, before I could say anything about it, I went and looked around at the kind of in unconditional cash transfers that had been done, and there sure are not many. Uh, there are some that have taken place as um, research projects, and those mostly are in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there's one notable one in Kenya. And what that, those, that study specifically, the one in Kenya, but a lot of the other ones, what they found was that if you would like to see a really specific outcome, if you would like to um, really move the dial, conditionality works. It works great, actually. So um, you might say, let's increase um, college attendance. Well, we should increase test scores. We should increase, uh, we should nudge them to get A's. And that can tell us a whole lot. These studies tell us that people um, really respond to that. But I actually, I kind of want to go all the way back um, for a minute. 
we, when we first started talking about economic insecurity, we talked about different kinds of risk and different kinds of hazards and, that people are exposed to. That might be a financial collapse in the market. Uh, that might be a hurricane you know, hitting the region that you live in. It might be something um, social and systemic like racism. And certainly there's a lot of evidence that shows that racism has been a huge driver for um, keeping people, uh, not only in some people in poverty, but help uh, keeping it from, uh, people from getting out of it in some instances. So there's a lot of different causes. We talked also about these covariate causes. And we are so familiar with this. You know, one problem leads to another, right? And this would be the case where you say, uh, for example, um, I'm a construction worker, right? And I've got to get to work, and my car breaks down. Well, if I can't get to work, because my car broke down, am I going to get paid? Maybe not. Uh, probably not. If I don't have the money, can I fix my car? Before, I know I might have not only an income problem, but I might have a housing instability problem on top of that. And maybe household uh, tensions might rise and other problems. And, and a lot of people in poverty are really familiar with this. You, know, you just trip over one thing after another. And um, problems get worse. And in this case, we would want to say, let's do the most strategic thing that we can do to help this person become more economically secure. So where's this strategic investment in this story? It's in the car. All right. Let's use the tools to build a program for making this strategic investment. Could we make a, um, a program that's conditional on a person um, not only fixing their car, should they fix their car? Maybe that car should go. Um, maybe they need to get a new car. That's another complication to the program. Uh, we might have to means test them to find out, are they uh, eligible for this kind of thing? Uh, who could be in the program and who couldn't be? Could it be targeted? Could it be for everybody? And a lot of different questions come up. And you know, there's sort of some complicated reasons for why we don't have a lot of programs that address fixing cars for people when it might be a very strategic uh, kind of investment. Well, what if we just gave them the cash? Yeah. What if it was unconditional? In that case, they might be able to make that investment themselves. So this raises a couple questions, um, but it really has to do with the questions that we face when we th look at the way that we think. Um, people have talked over the morning about the history of poverty in the United States. We've had many, many decades of trying to address poverty. And some might say that some of the persistence has been uh, due to how we think about it. So. What are some of the questions that unconditional cash, for, cash transfers bring up? One is, do we think that uh, people who are living in poverty are capable of making the smart investment? Do we think that they're able to identify in their own lives the most strategic way to get themselves into economic security? Another question would be, do we think that we know better what that investment would be more than they do? Thanks so much. Any comments, uh, reflections that folks want to share? Right here. We've got to hear mics. OK. All right. Who are you and where are you from? Can you guys hear? No, here. You got to take the mic, sis. I've got to turn it on. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just curious if you did any research related to unconditional cash transfers. So never mind all of our programs for a minute. When most of us have gotten into a jam, who's the first person we call? We call our family, right? Or our friends. They give us money. 
in some cases. That's the unconditional cash transfer. So I guess I'm just curious, has any research been done related to that versus all the programs that we fund? Yeah, go oh, ahead. go ahead. And we have another question to define an unconditional cash transfer. All right, so uh, unconditional cash transfer definition and is anybody looking at this uh, issue? And then uh, right here next. Yeah. No. Got it on? All right. Um, thanks so much for the question. Um, certainly you spent a lot of time looking in, into this. And um, there are, I think the best research out there is proxy research. Like I think that what you're bringing up is a really great example of that. I haven't seen specifically um, in, in the case of family members, but I think the more ubiquitous and more well-known re proxy research would be in the case of earned income tax credit research. So this is um, a program at both at the state and federal level where people who meet certain thresholds uh, are able to receive cash. And we have been able to learn quite a bit about how people spend the, those resources. Generally, the literature on that is split into two camps. Those camps are down, um, due to methodology. One is these massive surveys that are done of all consumers in the month of February, where most people you spend that money. Um, they have tended to see that there is a small uptick in some like entertainment type categories, but by and large, a lot of the consumption that goes on in that month, especially at the beginning, and we think that people who get those, those uh, credits get them right away because they know they can get them, um, spend them on assets. That's consistent with the research that was done from randomized control trials in uh, the few places where it was tried, um, especially in Kenya. The other body of research, uh, just surveys of people who get, uh, got that uh, benefit, had really similar results. Essentially, the, the sort of like the story, in a sense, is that, yep, let's go out to dinner, and then let's put it towards those things that we absolutely know uh, we need to take care of, like fixing the car or something. I, I'd also add that when we think about assets, um, we those of us who don't live in poverty um, have uh, not it, not living in poverty isn't just about income, as folks have talked about, right? It's also about social connection and living in relationship with other folks who can help us when we need that when we need that help. And so, an important part of getting out of poverty is that building of assets that Steve was talking about. You forgot to tell you one other thing. <laughs> and then we're going to go right here. We're going to go back and forth like this for a while. I think I was answering the question what research has been done. Um, there's some research that has not been done yet. Um, and one, uh, one of those uh, bodies of research is one that we're working on. Uh, we're currently working on a randomized controlled trial of unconditional cash transfers, uh, wherein uh, people who are um, getting their text forms filled out are part of a survey, and they fill out three different surveys over a course of four months, and half of them receive $1,000, and half of them receive 50. We don't have the results back from that data, but uh, we're certainly really interested to find out uh, what it'll show. Uh, specifically, we're using uh, CFED's uh, body of, of questionnaires around financial behavior and financial attitudes, and have also added in some measures around empowerment. Uh, we're really interested to find out if um, the benefits of being able to plan and then uh, act on those plans has other benefits um, outside of just the cash. Great, so we'll be looking into that. Oh, thanks. The unconditional cash transfer is simply cash that's transferred without asking for any specific behavior around that uh, transfer. So if um, you were to give me an unconditional cash transfer, which I would like, <laughs> um, <laughs> then you would just be giving me money, and then I would be walking away and doing what I want with that. <laughs> My, as some of you may have heard uh, this conversation about a universal basic income, it's the same concept. Let's go right here. 
Hi, I'm Keith Cuny. I'm with uh, Capo here. I do the energy policy for the state of Oregon. Um, I like this conversation around universal basic income. But um, as a community action person, I think one of the things we pride ourselves is the ability to pull in programs and, and uh, leverage and braid. And with a universal basic income cash transfer, we lose possibly that face-to-face -face connection with the person in which we can see if they have gangrene or an infection and get them into other services. How do you make that up? If we're just gonna give people a universal basic income, do we lose them forever if they're in squalor? How do we get them out of their house? Is, how much benefit is it to come in and see them face-to-face? -face? Um, I think kind of going back to what BJ talked about before, um, some of the efficiencies that can be brought in um, through redesigning the way that we do our work doesn't necessarily exclude uh, being in relationship with people, but in fact, it might actually open us up more to do that kind of work that we want to do. I certainly hear a lot um, of caseworkers saying that I, do, I spend too much time on paperwork and less time in relationship, mm -hmm. and we think that we'd be a lot more effective if we could be in relationship. So I think this could be a, an opportunity of efficiency. We might not necessarily lose that relationship. Great. One more comment, question, before we uh, close. Right on. Hi, Brenda Durbin from Clackamas County. Um, so I know a little bit about uh, some studies that were done in the South with a, a low-income community where there was um, where a, a casino opened. So yep. the Native Americans in that community received um, resources from the casino, and so you had this you know great sort of randomized sort of study, and they showed significant increase in all kinds of measures for the Native American families compared to the non-Native families who didn't get. Um, the resources from the casino, and they attributed some of that to just just hope that that now um, the adults in the households had the hope that they would be able to, to to provide for their children. The dollar figure wasn't significant, but the impact was great. So, sounds from seeing the head nod, sounds like you guys are familiar with that. Can you speak to that? And does that uh, can that relate to a larger sort of universal basic income sort of concept? Sure. Um, so, a, f yeah. a few different points on that. Um, we are trying to include some of those questions in our research. Uh, certainly we've looked at some of the research from um, students getting scholarships for college very early on, like in, in preschool or kindergarten. They know that they're going to be able to go to college. And uh, part, one of the ideas out of that research is the idea of college-bound identity. And uh, we might kind of extrapolate from that and say, you know, th what would thriving bound I identity be like? You know, what would that kind of hope do for people? A lot of what we talked about early on, um, the uncertainty that comes with economic insecurity means that people don't have the information to make, oftentimes, the decisions that they would have made had they known more. And some of that insecurity is, am I going to be able to make rent next month or not? with some more security, some more um, ability to plan, they might be able to make different choices because they have more information. I think that that kind of hope uh, really speaks to that. Um, and we're certainly hoping that, that that works in the unconditional side. In terms of the universal basic income side, uh, one of the, surprisingly, one of the sites of this conversation has been in Silicon Valley among venture, or venture capitalists. And I was shocked, but one of the main interests that they have is that they think, well, um, if, the, if people have, if there's a universal basic income, then there might be more innovation. There might be more risk that people might be willing to take. Some people would have more, they'd have more certainty, and so they'd be more willing to start businesses and things like that. So. Um, Certainly, we think that unconditional cash transfers and universal basic income could really address the uncertainty uh, by providing hope. Great. Yeah, one last question right here. Yeah. So I'm Vanessa Gaston. I'm a director for Clark County Community Services. So I'm struggling with this idea because I actually come from poverty, and I have a lot of family members still in poverty. I was born outside the Pine Ridge Reservation. It's one of the most poorest reservations in the country. 
And um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came in and bought up a lot of our family's land to give it back to the tribe, and they gave them huge lump sums of cash. And I have to tell you, um, I thought it was a good thing until I saw some of my family members in back up in poverty in a matter of months, mm -hmm. can show nothing for that money. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like, how do you help educate people who barely got out of, a lot of them didn't even finish high school, mm -hmm. understand how to, what money means, the value of dollar, how to budget, have some confidence in those dollars and st not live day to day, hour to hour kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that because I'm struggling with it because yes. of my own personal experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. <laughs> and again, I think the, the challenge is, uh, it, I think earlier as Rand said, what works in one community is not going to work in another. And I think some of these other comments of uh, you can be just as irresponsible in a conditional program as you can in an unconditional program, right? You can uh, use money as uh, either a tool for empowerment and building hope, and that carries with it a responsibility for relationship and for commitment and for ongoing uh, work together, or you can use it as a way to, you know, whatever. I don't want to characterize uh, what happened with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, but I really appreciate you giving a counterpoint and raising some concerns, because it was clear many people in the audience were having some of those similar thoughts about how that might work and how it actually might be counterproductive to a family who is uh, trying to uh, find their way out of poverty. So, uh, all right, Pius and you go. We're, we're, we're on a roll now. You press, Pius and you go. Well, you got to have a mic. Here comes the mic. This is a really the last comment. <laughs> Make it good. Well, I, I, I was kind of... Who are you? My name is Pius and I'm the Senior Research and Evaluation Analyst at Multnomah County as well. And I was just thinking about your comment. My family also comes from poverty, came from an immigrant family, and... Just thinking about um, Steve's and um, Aaron's presentation, and I don't think the, the, it's, this is necessarily a counterpoint, uh, the, the, the comment that you made. I actually see that as sort of an, a relational component. I think that when we're thinking about these unconditional cash transfer, I think this is the right move. I think there's additional things that we need to be talking about, such as um, getting rid of the systematic oppression that we live in. And if we were to really you know, give opportunities for families to succeed beyond just money, I think we will see that many of these families are going to be very successful in getting out of poverty and succeeding in further generations you know, from that cycle. So I think that one of the challenges that we're not addressing from just talking about it just through the cash transfer lens is that we're not thinking about all the ways that these families don't have other resources, such as they don't know where to go to get college education. They don't know how to succeed in college. They don't have mentors when they are done with college to get into you know, a good work program. So there, there's a lot of other things that we can add to it, but I think this is a wonderful first step to that conversation. And so that's sort of how I was hoping we can end on a positive note. <laughs> I thought we're, there was a great uh, comment over here as well. I want to say thank you one more time to Aaron and Steve.